Hi everyone, welcome to this video. My name is T. If you're new here, I really do hope everyone's day is going well. Let me tell you a little story. In my freshman year of college, I had sex for the very first time. I would say I lost my virginity, but as the saying goes, I didn't lose a damn thing. I know exactly where I put it. Some may say that once the act is done for the first time, the rest is smooth sailing. Oh, but on the contrary. For some reason, I felt stuck. So on one hand, I was lit as fuck. What? I was really feeling myself. Not necessarily because my first sexual encounter was just oh so impressive, hell no. But because of what it represented, I had finally done the thing. The big momentous thing that I had thought about and anticipated for so long. And as I started to get more comfortable exploring with new partners, learning what I liked and what I didn't, I knew that this thing would change the trajectory of my adulthood. And it did. I have sat before this camera, looking many different ways, sharing many different thoughts. But the constant is obvious. Before I am anything else, I am a black woman and a proud sexual being. Ah, but I'm getting ahead of myself, so back to college. Why the hell did I still feel so stuck? Oh, but on the contrary. At the courtesy of puritanical teachings and of course, the patriarchy, I was immediately tasked with the burden of balancing my sexual inclinations against social condemnations. How could I live in the fullness of my sexuality when I struggled to accept it as an actual part of my humanity in the first place. As I furthered in this battle internally, on the outside world, female sexuality was having a renaissance. <laughs> Movies, shows, music, especially music. Everywhere I looked, I was reminded that this particular organ at the intersection of my thighs was powerful, magical even. It could move mountains. It could evoke emotions. It could inspire change. Gone were the days of disconnection from my own body. Sexual purpose and possibility were up to me to decide. Goodbye, shame-riddled vagina. Usher in the all-powerful pussy or as we'll call it today the p in its redefined image performance and functionality i was invited to join in on the fun and shed any negativity any insecurity any ounce of confusion that society has taught me to harbor between my legs sex especially when had or spoken of frequently and explicitly was no longer just an activity it was liberation. Or was it? For me, Nicki Minaj is revival in pink hair and Barbie chains. She solidified her place in hip hop, in part because she gave us black femininity in its multifaceted glory. At a time where being a black woman who was equal parts animated, colorful, serious, and sexual was practically unheard of. Certainly not very well respected. Nikki's work brought me constant reminders of a woman's ability to view her sex appeal as a powerful instrument that, if utilized, could get her anything she wanted, including loyalty, status, and of course, money. So I'm sure you can understand my disappointment when she interviewed with Elle magazine and expressed judgment towards women who have sex for materialism or any sort of profit. For me, Megan Thee Stallion is true to this, not new to this exhibition in leotards and cowboy hats. She is a refreshing force who, despite the world's constant attempts to defeminize and shame her for her unambiguous black features, will stop at nothing to drill it into our minds that when it comes to her sexuality, outside opinions ain't stopping a damn thing. If the category is sex, 
You better believe Megan Thee Stallion is bringing extreme skill and experience to the table. So I'm sure you could understand my heartbreak when she got on Hot 97 and chose to distance herself from the same promiscuity she totes in her music. Reassuring viewers that she hasn't had that many sexual partners because she gotta keep the mileage low. Cardi B, oh my goodness. For me, Cardi B is a self-made, fun-filled firecracker in AP bust downs and six inch acrylics. She came in the game with a clear message. She's never gonna fake who she is and she is always gonna uplift those around her especially other women. So I'm sure you can understand my confusion when she, like many female rappers, make music that consistently feeds into a competitive girl fight narrative. Who's the prettiest? Who's the richest? Who's the sexiest? Let me say this loud and clear. The mere gumption of these hypersexual performers to constantly defy sexual repression by existing in ways that black women especially have been denied and even socially prosecuted for. It's audacious. It's artful. It's invigorating. It's the reason why I'm sitting here in this stiffy ass, itchy ass wig to begin with. And as a consumer, that is freeing just to witness. But when I truly examine the set of rules that the hypersexual market requires in order to thrive, when I truly examine the do's and don'ts, the why's and the why nots, I find a lot of polarity, dare I say, hypocrisy. I find a veneer of liberation, absolutely, a very polished and convincing veneer, but a nucleus of some values that are pretty damn ancient, and if left undecorated, could be seen as the total opposite of liberation. I swear, it was just 2010 when I thought pink wigs and thick ass was going to save the planet and ultimately redefine feminism as we knew it. And in some ways, it yeah, a little thing has been done. Yeah. But as I further in this work, and I am reminded all the time that everything requires nuance, anything is eligible for a re-examination. At this moment in time right now, today... I'm not so sure. Chapter one, the P word, an elusive etymology. The composition of the hypersexual black woman performer is simple. She is young, a median age of late twenties, but no older than 40. Her body is either surgically modified or naturally proportioned in a way that appeals to the black male gaze. Perky breasts, a small waist, and a fat ass. Equally visible from the front as it is from the back. Her fashion is flamboyant and largely influenced by black sex worker aesthetics. With hair colorful and bold enough to light up a room, heels high enough to trample on the soles of her enemies, and nails long enough to cut a bitch if they dare try to cross her. The title of bad bitch is not only deserved, it's practically a birthright. The image of her lifestyle signifies opulence, indulgence, shameless excessiveness and extreme consumerism. Her demeanor is confident, her personality intriguing, but most of all, she fearlessly and tirelessly defends her position in the hypersexual market. And her most powerful weapon is not the money, the cars, or the clothes. It's her language. <laughs> The P word has been a descriptor for many different things, ranging from cat to cow word to vulva. Merriam-Webster's second of four definitions for this word is vulgar usage, noun, vulva, sexual intercourse, or the female partner in sexual intercourse. Okay. If you were to tell me to define the P word, I would have guessed vulva. Absolutely, certainly. Maybe sexual intercourse, but a female partner? In sexual intercourse? I think the not. Because we typically don't use the P word and woman interchangeably. Or do we? 
as we know, it's very common for someone to say something like, tonight, I'm getting some money. Instead of tonight, I am having sex with a woman or I am having sex with someone with a vagina. Now granted, they don't roll off the tongue the same way, right? One word signifies the presence of ego, the desire to be deemed impressive, while the other, not so much. But I believe the reason why we don't say we are having sex with blank is because that's not actually what's happening. And the word pussy is meant to signify that. In this context, sex is not being had with a woman or a person, a whole person comprised of eyes, a nose, a mouth, and a full range of emotions, but rather a pussy. A device of sorts, completely untethered from human form. It is truly an object of imagination with, as we'll discuss today, an image, functionality, and importance that in very few ways resembles that of what could ever belong to an actual human being. Now, while I have thoughts on the questionable life force that the P has taken on, I will say that bringing that word to the forefront of modern English language was the exact confrontation that some of these motherfuckers needed. Because whether we are talking about it in actuality or in imagination, it's still an obsession. Wars have been started, laws have been made. In our lifetime, human rights have been stripped away all because of the obsession with it. Yeah, everybody wanna keep it on the hush. So in a way, these hypersexual performers constantly saying the word can be seen as a confrontation of that obsession. That's the exact way I interpreted the message of Megan Thee Stallion's thought shit video. Let's talk about that video actually, because I didn't, they, they didn't hear from, the streets did not hear from me the way they should have when the video initially dropped. So let's spin the block again, okay. She begins it by introducing a white man who is a senator. So in America at least, there's only a couple dozen seats ahead of him before he is literally one of the most powerful people on earth. And I love how subtly she highlighted this irony because I remember when the song WAP dropped with Cardi B and there were literal politicians giving their two cents about it on Twitter. Again, some of the most powerful people in the country, arguably the world, chasing fucking clout. And better yet, on the same website where people have daily arguments over whether or not pineapple belongs on pizza. Back to the video, the senator is taking time out of his day at the office to not only consume and thus passively support Megan's music video, but in order to soothe himself for the fact that he is helping keep the lights on at the hot girl headquarters whether he like it or not, he decides to leave a hate comment. How original. And once that's done, he unzips his pants, commence that thing thing with the wine schling, you know what I'm saying. And then Meg calls him up and she's like, look motherfucker, these regressive whores you're trying to step on are actually the people you depend on. Now the way I interpreted that was, it's not just Megan, the rapper with her ass out. It's sanitation engineers, garbage truck drivers, and as we saw throughout the video, waitresses, secretaries, nurses, doctors. They are all sexual beings in their own way. All free to express that however they choose or don't. So yeah, it was definitely nice to see Megan reiterate a point that we have been making for like, ever. That was nice. And this video was especially cool because it seemed like it took place in the 90s, maybe the 80s, I'm not sure. And this video taking place in prior decades also signifies that this is nothing new. All this pussy, 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 sex, 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 nothing new. Sometimes older generations try to make it seem like we are just a special kind of obscene and indecent. Oh my goodness, have you heard what's on the radio lately? Oh my gosh, have you seen what the young women are wearing lately? This generation is so sex obsessed. What about the kids? Bruh, what about them fucking kids? What always gets me is the sex obsessed part because actually, based on studies done in the past five years, Gen Z and millennials are having record less sex than prior generations. And this is for a number of factors. One being, we just got other shit to do. Julesy said, have you ever looked at a family tree and seen how people were just mass producing children like factories? It's because they were bored and they had nothing better to do but fuck. Because rent is high. Discussion of sex, however, discussion of sex, however, has seen a dramatic increase in younger generations. But just because we're talking more about sex, even with increasing vulgarity, doesn't mean that it's a newer version. It's the same old activity, just new norms 
and newer forms of expression. One of those many forms being music. Now, when it comes to language, I am not critical of the confrontational, unfiltered aspect of things. Like, no, never me gonna be critical about why saying the bad words feel so damn good. Come on now. I am critical because we have the power to take it even further. We have the power to say, okay, now that we've caused some discomfort with our language, now that we've stirred the pot, we can also examine how that same language affects us in real life. Like outside of the music videos, outside of Twitter. And here's where we can shift the spotlight away from the word P and use just about anything that has gone from offensive to empowering. Take the reclamation of words like bitch or ho, for example. Those are words that, even outside of music, can be used interpersonally as terms of endearment. And while I'm happy that we can jokingly call each other bitch, does that reclamation change the fact that negatively or positively, bitch and ho are gendered terms aimed at women? Does it change the fact that a woman's demeanor or her sex life is tied to her character? And depending on who that offends, can risk her reputation, her job, her motherhood? Does it allow women the grace to still be imperfect individuals? Are the bitches and hoes of real life being taken seriously if and when their rights are violated? Or are they considered too indecent to be victims? I wonder if the reason these questions aren't addressed in the same spaces where we so loudly and proudly call this stuff feminism is because that would then require us to step out of the hypersexual, hypercapitalist fantasy. And that's just not cute enough. See, because that sounds like the angry, insufferable, hairy armpit feminism. And that's not what y'all signed up for, right? It's okay, this is a safe space. Y'all signed up for the bad bitch, boss bitch, all about her money feminism. And you see all of this nuance, all of this conversation, it's just not given that. Sometimes it feels like we are so desperate to justify the things that makes us feel good as women that we will try to bend and mold feminism or other movements of gender equity so that it works for us. Like we want feminism to come to us rather than joining the movement. What I'm getting at is, just because something badass is happening involving women, especially involving our sexuality, it doesn't automatically make it a liberating political movement. It doesn't automatically make it regressive either, but what it does make it is something that deserves nuance. Certainly something that deserves an honest assessment of who it benefits and who it does not. Chapter two, the feminist gaze and the liberation masquerade. Khadija and Bo did a video a couple weeks ago called, Are We Turning Away From Sex Positive Feminism? Take a look at what they have to say. Poor example, I love Beyonce down, right? I'm a Beyonce apologist. She's my billionaire anti-capitalist queen. I'm a Beyonce, leave me alone. I know, okay, I know. When Bell Hooks called her a terrorist, <laughs> I was like, girl, I, I hadn't read Bell Hooks like that at that time. So I was like, I don't know if I wanna read this author. No, Beyonce's not a terrorist. She's getting freaky. She's letting the girls get freaky and talk about feminism. We can do both and be a girl boss, hey. but. Thinking back on it, I wouldn't have used the word terrorist, but I understand more now what Hooks meant as best I can. And now it's more so she was seeing what a lot of us couldn't see at the time and are seeing now, which is the women that are peddling this brand of feminism that are like the Beyonce's or even maybe not as wealthy as Beyonce, maybe just like the Megan Thee Stallion's. They can afford still to have security. They can afford to live in a gated area. They're not walking down the street with their keys between their fingers for fear that somebody's gonna try it because they're wearing pum pum shorts because it's 48 degrees outside. Fair, Celsius. Pum pum shorts were a great example because I would consider those relatively casual attire that can be worn because they're cute and or like Khadija said, because it's hot outside. But even that simple attire could be predatorily mistaken as a sexual invitation even if that's not the type of timing you want. We can also take it a step further and speak to not just the average person's version of revealing clothing, but the exact attire that someone like a Beyonce or a Megan Thee Stallion would wear on stage or in a music video. We can talk about the black femmes who dress in that exact same attire, sometimes in even more revealing attire, who actually are looking for sexual attention. Like maybe sex workers? You see, this didn't just start with hypersexual performers 
The costuming of sex work attire has had the fashion industry in a chokehold for at least the past few decades. Notably, Versace's 1992 fall collection titled Miss s and showcased pieces inspired by real-life dominatrixes, which are still being worn by big stars of today. And when we talk about more accessible fashion, Fast fashion brands such as Fashion Nova and Shein have built empires off aesthetics that resemble those of femmes in the erotic workplace. We know this! But did you also know that according to Grojo.com, these two brands alone gross a combined estimated revenue of over $990 million per year? 900 <laughs> Now let me ask you, how much of that do you think has trickled down to your local stripper or escort? How much of that do you think has traveled from Hidden Hills, where all these rich people be at, to the corners of Skid Row? When this fashion, which at one point sex workers were arrested for, is put in the hands of celebrities who are protected by their wealth and their class, what is it doing for the women and femmes of whom they've drawn their inspiration from? Is their safety now being ensured? And again, while the sight of one of our favorite celebrities wearing that attire does a lot on the fronts of visibility and confrontation, similar to language, does that confrontation do anything for the people who need it the most? Genuinely ask yourself, is slut shaming decreasing? Not just in how we spew it out to others, but how we harbor it internally. Or is it still considered perfectly normal for these performers to be bragging about their sexual aptitude in one breath while protecting a reputation of angelic purity or, in the very least, shaming women who don't in the other? As mentioned by Gigi Fong in a writing called Sex Work and Fashion Are More Closely Linked Than You Think, quote, Many staples of sex workers' lifestyle have been appropriated for fashion, so much so that many don't even think or know to credit sex workers. One of these objects are pleaser shoes, a brand of heels that cater to strippers. A symbol of eroticism, this style of footwear fully supports the ankle and feet, allowing strippers to climb poles and do floor work safely. Rapper Saweetie is one of Pleaser's celebrity fans and has worn the brand's towering silhouettes on several occasions to elevate her outfits. It is jarring then that in her song My Type, the artist seemingly distances herself from women who perform sex work. Well, you the type that's fucking for the rent. You with that. End quote. This has always been an especially sore spot for me. And if you've been watching this channel for like at least two, two and a half years, you know. I had a video discussing this exact same thing. Would you believe that video was like eight minutes long? What, like, sweetie, what surface was you cracking? Come on now. Anyway, this whole promiscuously modest, oxymoronic image that these hypersexual performers cling to for dear life, mm, it pisses me off. Because be fucking for real. Why don't we just be honest and say, in the hypersexual market, it is safer for women, especially heterosexual women, to oscillate through this vulgar virgin pendulum because it allows them the grace to cause men just enough discomfort so that they feel empowered as women while still aligning close enough with male values so that they don't die without a husband. I stand pretty firm in these thoughts, not only because they've been supported through observation, but of course, as always, through past personal experience. Do you know how many times I've heard from the men I've dated, from men in my comments? Good luck getting a husband with that mouth. Mm. Mm, mm. Cause first of all, who who gonna tell him? A husband. Don't ever threaten me like that ever again. Because women's self-respect is a threat to male structural power. It's, I didn't just come up with that. This is like known information, I hope. I wish that as consumers, women especially, we would recognize that yes, we are doing something that makes us happy collectively at that. But aside from what's at the forefront, the costumes, the language, Hardly any revolution has been made. We're kind of at a standstill. But here's where it gets even better, oh my gosh. That's okay. It's okay that we're at a standstill, why? Because women's joy does not have to be revolutionary. It does not have to be political. It likely will be, but in this spot that we're stuck in, it's not due to the language or the outfits. It's not that 
all of that extremity is setting us back. It's the intention behind it and our inability to critically analyze that for fear of losing it. It's almost like if we can't write think pieces and make video essays about the bigger picture of singing about wet ass p then somehow we're not allowed to have that kind of music and we're not allowed to feel good when we listen to it. And that's just not true. Women's enjoyment collectively or individually does not have to be political to deserve space in this world. But I'm gonna keep going because it gets so much worse. We talked about the contradictions in costuming and language, but also in the hypersexual market, how women approach sex as a general concept, just in general, how it is meant to feel, who does what, who deserves to be in an advantage and why, also draws direct influence from the male gaze. Dead dick don't run me. You better get on your knees and eat this seat right. We toss niggas around, we treat these niggas like they be I felt this way for a while, but I'm glad to have been introduced to work from decades ago that also supports this. In that same video, Khadija also references a writing called Casualties of the Sex War, written by Karen Durbin in 1972, in which Durbin explains that casual sex, which at that time was emerging as this new, hip approach to intimacy, was not given the sexual freedom it was supposed to give. Quote, the fact remains, men are a necessity to heterosexual women. One sees, however, some peculiar accommodations to that heterosexuality now, primarily the stillborn attempts by women to forge these new, freer relationships with men. The old nightmarish dependence begins to go out the window as one divests oneself from the idea of marriage happily ever after. But what is taking its place? Partly, it seems, a game of imitate the oppressor, Women talk about the freedom to treat men as sex objects. This is a political and emotional dead end for a movement that in its early years spoke out strongly for preserving that humanistic sensibility, which has traditionally been attributed to the so-called weaker sex. The point was not that women should become hard-nosed power seekers or cool sexual manipulators, in other words, imitation men, but rather that by insisting on their full humanity, by refusing to permit men to treat them as objects, they would force the discovery of new humane sexual relationships." End quote. Instead of this new age sex being something that allowed people, especially women, the freedom to connect with others solely on a sexual level, without having to worry that things like purity culture and ego and gender expectations would get in the way or worse, punish them, people said, or? You know it sounds way easier than that. Let's just stop acknowledging each other's humanity altogether. Let's just recognize each other as bodies and we'll be able to avoid all of that. Again, Durbin wrote that in 1972. My mother wasn't even born yet. And we still hear similar themes in the music we're discussing today, in rap music, especially by men. Sex is rarely centered on pleasure. There's a lot of pleasure buzzwords, sure, but you will be hard pressed to find a hip hop song of present or past that is solely discussing sex and the act of it and how it feels without attaching it to egotism or materialism. Because the main goal isn't sex itself, it's power assumption. Come on now, hashtag be fucking for real. And we hear women in rap doing the same shit. Imitating the attitudes and values of men during sex, which again are stereotypically selfish, aggressive, power seeking, does not guarantee women anything aside from a fleeting eco stroke. It doesn't guarantee our safety, our consideration, or orgasms. And is that not what the fuck we showed up for? Overall, I feel it's become very popular to hold these really callous attitudes towards sex under the guise of keeping it casual, even though casual is the last thing that's happening here. You see, casual requires irregularity and a lack of concern. This shit is a thoroughly planned conquest. When a person enters a sexual situation with full intention to be selfish and seek domination, especially when that hasn't been explicitly expressed to the other parties involved, I would say the only thing casual about that is the rotation of the partners. Everything else sounds pretty methodical to me. A great example is Nikki's boss ass bitch freestyle, which at one point, Nah, because that was my pledge of fucking allegiance. Do you hear me? Anyway, for those who don't know, the most iconic part 
of that whole song is where she enters like a rule book. <clears throat> the text reads, rule number one to be a boss ass bitch, never let a clown nigga try to play you. If he play you, then rule number two is fuck his best friends and make them yes men. Then get a dick pic and then you press send <laughs> and send a red heart and send a kissy face and tell him that his friends love how you mm, taste. Are you kidding me? Like, are you joking me right now? But listen, that's not casual. That's a conquest. And what about that, aside from revenge, caters to her desires? What if doing something like that doesn't actually enact revenge? What if the person that they're trying to hurt still doesn't care? Is it still worth it? Or was it yet another reactive, power-seeking move made with someone else's emotions as the contingency for her satisfaction. I am not at all against casual sex as I do feel it works for some, but that requires maturity and emotional regulation, emotional intelligence first and foremost, to not conflate things like detachment and disrespect. Again, stuff like the boss bitch rule book can be very fun to say. But we cannot get it twisted. This is no political revolution. Largely in part because it calls no accountability to men. Have you noticed the irony? I've been sitting here talking about this for how long and how many different wigs, and we ain't talked once about what men are gonna do to help us in this fight. Yes, we have changed the narrative so that we are now the sexual subjects, not the sexual objects. Yes, we have, we have done that. But what's being done on men's side of the seesaw? which is still way high up in the air, might I add, what's being done to make sure that the clear disparity between how men are incentivized for having sex with women versus the cost women have to pay, the metaphorical debt, the fucking bankruptcy women have to enter each and every time we try to take authority over our own pleasure. Are men doing their part in leveling out that imbalance? No. We know the answer is no, I'm just fucking with you. But if we're gonna call this liberation and a reclamation of power, we should also ask ourselves, are we even requiring that of them? Or are we saying that the ego boost we get from co-opting misogynistic views of sex is good enough? And the opportunity for some of us, a very select few of us to make money from it is also good enough. Because men ain't hurting from this. They're really not. Not to say that the goal of all this is to make men upset, because I mean, it's a small reward. But that's not like the goal. There may be a few men who disapprove of the hypersexual market, but men's structural power as a whole is not being disrupted just because Megan Thee Stallion is shaking her ass on stage. Men are likely benefiting because if these performers are influencing a generation of women to say, look, I want it when I want it and I'm gonna get it when I want it and I'm not gonna feel guilty for it. Of course men are benefiting because who the hell else are these straight women having sex with? Lesbians, this is not our time to be funny or cute. And so because of that outcome, which still benefits men but is almost not at all advantageous for women, sometimes I wonder if the purpose of this whole thing to begin with was to seem more appealing to men. Mm. No, because I don't want to accept that. I don't want to accept that reality. That make my chest hurt too much. But it's a possibility, right? Because then why else would we imitate and remix their values, values which are not rooted in women's well-being, but rooted solely in how desirable we are? Coming up in part two. Dick and balls stink. Oh, oh you want to get fucked up. You want to get... But funnily enough, when men have a stench, it's considered manly, like, it's considered like, yeah, macho, like, fuck yeah, I'm a man. That's why I smell like this. But we gotta smell like pineapples and strawberries and daisies? Huh. Huh. But under the pressure of social expectation, people with vaginas feel compelled to distance it from just about any function unrelated to sexual desirability. And we gotta work to unlearn that. Thank you all so much for watching this video, especially if you made it all the way to the end. Let me tell you, this video is nearly a year in the making. 
and this is actually my fourth time attempting to record it. I first came up with this video concept in about November of 2021, and I've just now been able to articulate my thoughts. And I do still think there's a lot of room left for them to evolve, of course, but I really just wanted to give you all an idea of how complicated and delicate of a topic this was for me. But just because it was complicated and maybe even a little bit contradictory, I still had to jump on it. I still had to say what I had to say because like, that's what we should do. It's always been my mission to acknowledge that there is complication in everything we consume, damn near everything we enjoy. And what we should do instead of running away from that is engage with it and critically examine it for a clear understanding. Thank you also to my lovely patrons. This video will likely be demonetized, I know. Look, I really try my best with the whole P and the V, but I think I've said one too many variations of sexual intercourse and genitalia for YouTube to let me slide on this one. So yeah, I'm preparing for that. Um, YouTube might get me, but you know who else got me? My patrons. Okay, even when YouTube lets me down, y'all definitely help me see some return for my hard work because look, I know I make it look easy and very cute, but it is hard. So thank you patrons. Be sure to leave your thoughts and your comments down below. Give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down, however you're feeling today and subscribe for more content. I'll catch you in the next video. Bye.